We'll let you simply tell us what you would like to tell us, uh, keeping in mind that uh, we've got a little bit of a short time here, and it'd be nice if we have some time at the end to actually uh, talk with you while you're here. But if you want to just tell us a little bit about the issues that you're confronting in compensation and any recommendations you have for us as to where we need to get to and how we ought to get there, uh, understanding that wherever we're going may have to happen over a period of uh, at least a few years. But I'm going to ask represent us uh, represent. I'm going to ask Superintendent Greg Little from the Mount Airy City Schools if he'll start. Sure. Well, first of all, I'd like to say, first of all, I'd like to say, on behalf of our superintendents, we really appreciate the opportunity to come speak to you today about such an issue as important as teacher compensation. Um, I'll just take a couple of minutes that I'd like for this committee to consider a really key question, and that key question is, who who do we want teaching our children and our grandchildren? And if we want that person to be committed to education, passionate about kids, a willingness to learn and grow their professional skills, then we have to pay those people accordingly. And when I walk into an, an advanced placement calculus classroom, and I ask the kids in that classroom, who in here wants to be a teacher, and nobody raises their hand, that tells us the types of people that we're attracting. We want our best and brightest in the classroom because I want Kaylee and Naomi to have those I want those kinds of teachers to be in their lives and have those kinds of teachers to impact them and have such a, a, a meaningful impact. So I just want to begin there and, and say I think that's a, a critical question that we have to consider and there's an urgency behind that because we have kids going to school today and we want them to have incredible teachers every step along their educational path. Okay, uh, Superintendent Sean Wilson from Wilson County. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair Michael. You've been a great partner in this dialogue about education for five years I've been here. <coughs> thank you to the committee. Um, our recent Regional Education Service Alliance, uh, that was in, we're in the Central Carolina recess, and we go from Triangle over to uh, as far east as um, Pitt and Green County. We cover a good part of this, this region. Recently, have put together a white paper on this issue of the teacher shortage that we're working with. And the, the gist of that paper reflects on the fact that this is a complex problem. But we've de incentivized teaching pretty much on every level. We, we, we've we struck at the security that teachers once felt through things like tenure, predictability of pay raises, benefits, being both health and retirement benefits are, are things that you know we've attacked a little bit. Um, salaries we've discussed at length, so we know where we stand with salaries. But then issues to do with climate professionalism support, things like uh, time teachers have for training, the support they get with teacher assistants, uh, the, the restrictions we put on the calendar, cut down their work days for their professional growth. And of course, resources they're not getting either. So now we have security, salaries, and climate. And at the other end of that, we have a pipeline where we know we have fewer people going in to education in general in our in our schools. And then we also have licensure issues where we're one of the toughest states to get licensed to be a teacher, or for that matter, to be a professional educator, because it happened at my level. My superintendent <coughs> did not travel with me from Maryland to North Carolina. So all of the issues that affect supply and demand in teaching are things that we've, we've chipped away at over the last few years. So the answer needs to be complex. Uh, but I'll, I'll let some of the others speak possibly to the answers we, we need to address. But you know, my personal take, we do we will need to start with an across the board increase. But I also think we need to look at ways that we can grow the teacher leadership ranks. What can we do to incentivize growth within the classroom where teachers have a bigger impact on students and on the schools in general. So looking at strategies for uh, creating another layer of leadership within the schools, but a classroom-based layer. Okay. Uh, Superintendent Beverly Emory from Winston Salem for Sight. Let me also echo my thanks for this opportunity, and uh, I think our group would welcome getting in the weeds on some of the strategy if, uh, if that is helpful as well as you move this forward. I, I want to share a couple of things. Um, 
I echo, I will support what my colleagues say, and I, I think a lot of what you heard yesterday about how we create a threshold for pay across the board, but I don't want us to lose what we know about effective teachers, and uh, some of what I brought to share, I would encourage everybody to look at the study of urban America called the Irreplaceables, which really does give us research to say that an effective teacher can have a five to six month student gain impact on, on student outcomes, which is what we're all trying um, to reach here. And there are some key strategies in the irreplaceables that have absolutely nothing to do with money. Um, one of them is about leaders and school climate, and I'm most appreciative to see that you are adding the complexity of administrators' salaries into this. Our school-based leaders have capacity to help us retain teachers. Some of that is by involving them in decision making and for us as districts and a state to create these teacher leader opportunities that are so important. I visited with a team last week, the Denver Public Schools, that are three years into a very complex but impressive teacher leader program. They are not doing that necessarily with additional compensation, but teachers have comp time, so they are free each week to observe, evaluate, coach, mentor, train other teachers. And I think that we could be a state that really could lead in that regard because so many of the pieces of that, of that infrastructure are happening around our districts. In Winston-Salem for Scythe, um, just a little bit of our story for the first time ever this year. We started the year with 25 elementary school vacancies. Um, having exceptional children or math and science uh, uh, has not been new to us over time, but for the first time that we've kept these records, we actually could not fill elementary teaching positions at the beginning of the school year. And so I think we're going to have to be creative about what it is we do. I've also brought you um, hot off the press. I said that um, somebody was smiling on me this week when I got the invitation. Um, through the generous support of local donors, we um, were able to commission a study through the Broad Foundation, and we asked them to pull together the research, leading research on retention and recruitment. And then also, here are some exemplars from around the country, school, school districts around the country that are having some success with that. Um, I, I do want to say that teachers in my district tell me that it's not that great big huge increase they're looking for, but some commitment over time would go a long way. Um, a three-year plan, 333, three, three, something that they know they can plan for. And I think the other piece that I would leave you with, and I don't know how we do that um, as a state, certainly LEAs need to do it. Um, one of the other key factors that research supports is that we need to tell our most effective teachers very publicly they're effective. And we have a little bit of trouble in our systems um, treating people differently. But in fact, we have solid research now that says if we have effective teachers, we need to lift them up and say, these are the effective teachers in our district, and find ways for them to help us help those who are not as effective. And I also think that is not beyond us as a state to look at what does that recognition look like? Is it a credential? Is it some way that we can say oh, we value these folks who are genuinely making a difference? in our schools. Thank you. Uh, Superintendent John Parker from my uh, hometown of Runner Rapids. Uh, they have you run Rapids City Schools. Right, right. Uh, thank you, Representative Blackwell and panel. Uh, appreciate it. as my colleagues doing this opportunity. Um, I would echo the sentiments of my colleagues in a very general way. Uh, I'd like to give a perspective representing Runner Rapids, not only Runner Rapids, but Northeastern North Carolina. And just to give you a bit of context, I'm serving as the interim superintendent in Runner Rapids uh, after having been superintendent there for five years from 01 to 06. And um, preceded that with an interim superintendency in the spring of 2014 in Northampton County. 
Uh, so the first perspective for Rona Rapids in particular, when I was there from 01 to 06, we took on the issue of teacher recruit, recruitment wholeheartedly as a district because of our belief that a stable teaching force of high quality people was the key to uh, student outcomes, and I mean student outcomes in a more comprehensive way than just test scores, I mean producing good citizens. Uh, we identified our primary recruiting bases as and a very hard time in that area, and I mean Northeastern North Carolina in general, because of our isolation from colleges and universities and distance from colleges and universities to get teacher candidates. Uh, so we did find that we got a lot of uh, prospective teachers who wanted to return to the area, so we focused on those graduates of our local high school who might want to come back, and we went to Pennsylvania and New York. Uh, Union states in which it was hard to get into. We have in Rhode Rapids now what I call a colony of Pennsylvanians that have chosen to stay, uh, which is a good thing. But I'll give you some numbers. At that time, 01 to 06, we reduced our retention rate, or we approved our retention rate, our turnover rate from 10% to 5% over a five year period. We recognized in Teacher Magazine. Uh, for the way we had done that because we used our professional development as a piggyback on national board uh, certification, dovetailing it with that because we thought that improved the quality of all of our teaching staff, but we were able to go to those job fairs, put a map down, and this goes to quality of life that was mentioned in one of your um, questions, put a map on the table and say, here's run of rapids, Here's Richmond, Virginia, Tidewater, Virginia, Research Triangle Park, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill. If you want a lifestyle that is lower key, less urban, with access to urban areas, come work with us. Now, to get in the door though, we needed to have salary incentive enough to be at least semi-competitive which we were able to do by saying 10% for a master's degree, 12% for national board certification, 22% on your base salary, and we are going to provide you professional development that helps you move in that direction. So we were able to do that that way. When I came back to run a Rapids as interim this year, I was disappointed to find that our turnover rate was 14%, but that was about the state average. So, and that's where we remain. We're again trying to strategize on how we go about doing that, but it'll have to be different strategies because now, as a matter of quality of life, a lot of our businesses are boarded up in time. So it's tied to the local economy. We've gone from 42% free and reduced lunch to 62% over that period of time. So the recession has hit us hard, and I think that you have to tie teacher retention in a general way into the economy of the area. And I've just mentioned my experience in Northampton County, which from the rankings I saw is the uh, highest teacher, teacher turnover in the state. In our high school that year I was there, out of a high school faculty of 35, we had 18 Teach for America teachers out of necessity. Uh, they're only there two years. Uh, which is uh, not, I worked for Teach for America in 1993, I appreciate the organization. <coughs> However, those students in Northampton County need in school consistent adult presences over a period of time. They, more than others, I would suggest, uh, because they don't necessarily get that in their home life. So Teach for America is great, However, when you're relying on that body of teachers to serve your students that are of such high need, you are not accomplishing much. Uh, so I wanted to throw that into the mix, but that goes to what my colleagues have said about we need a long-range plan. Teaching has become less of a career and more of a short-term job. And so I applaud you for looking at some long-term solutions and hope that you can continue with that mindset.
as I should be to him. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, Superintendent Mark Garrett from my neighbor, my new neighbor, now that I've moved west, like other young men, uh, McDowell. Is that not McDowell, but it's McDowell. 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 Yeah. McDowell, yes. So, uh, Ms. Gillespie taught me that pronunciation a few years back. Also, did you have another lady who was born and raised in McDowell? Also, oh, okay. Dr. Embry, so. Good. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Members, we appreciate the chance to have our voice heard. Um, I'm in my third district in North Carolina, and I moved to North Carolina in 2001 for the simple fact that Tennessee was way behind North Carolina in a lot of areas in education, so it was an attractive thing, so I came east. I didn't go west. Um, but the one thing that we've always counted on in the western part of the state has been the lifestyle choice. I was in Watauga, Adrian, now in McDowell, and just wanted to be in the mountains or they graduate from Appalachian or Western and then want to stay in that area. So what the rural districts or what my district has really banked on for a long time has been Asheville Buncombe hires theirs and then we get a lot of folks who they don't hire in that first round because we don't have a lot of kids in our area who are going on and we're working on that four-year college piece. So it's just now, the pipeline is just now really hitting us. We have a math position that someone left to go to Buncombe County uh, a couple of months ago. We've had zero applicants for, and that's the first time in the uh, three years I've been with the district that we have not had any applicants. Um, so the replacement and, and pipeline, especially at the secondary level, is what's really hitting us hard in our area um, and the region. 25% of my staff can walk out the door in the next five to eight years. 23% um, of my staff, or teaching staff, is zero to five years. So we've got a lot of younger folks. So that mentorship has been a, a big deal for us as we try to cultivate that as well. Um, so in, in our corner of the world, right now with Tennessee making the salary gains and some of the gains they made, South Carolina and Georgia, that's been what's difficult for us when we get those graduates is they can go right across the line and start that and, and start on their career in a state that is much more attractive on that front end salary wise. So I applaud the efforts that have been made on the front end with our teacher scale. But you know, the, the incentives to convince and or uh, retain our best talent in, in house is what I'm looking for in our rural area because we've got some really talented kids and because of them not choosing teaching as a career or who hear about all the negatives or some of the things that have come at them from inside and outside sources, a lot of times they don't even consider that as, you know, Dr. Little shared, they don't even consider that, consider that poor career right now which is really a shame because it's one of the more rewarding things, if not the most rewarding thing you can do. And I will stop right there, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Superintendent Frank Till from Cumberland County. Again, as my colleagues, thank you very much for inviting us um, to start this dialogue. And I won't repeat um, what my colleagues have say, except for in general, we have the same concerns in Cumberland County. Uh, we started the school year out with about 50 vacancies and what is really uh, endemic of what we're facing schools such as Jack Britt, which is one of the highest achieving schools in the state at the high school level is wanting for applicants for the position and some of our more affluent schools which used to have seven and eight applicants are lucky to get one for some positions so we're facing that uh, we also have been hit in our community because we're a military community and we're very proud of our military, we're very proud of this state and their their uh, uh, proactiveness for the military child. But when you look at the military spouse, we are not as proactive when it comes to teacher recruitment. We have uh, our laws and our regulations on licensing and receptivity and things such that are so onerous that many of our military people come and apply and quit after a couple of days because it's not worth the effort to try to get to our system. And so. Talking to our military leaders, we think that it's time that North Carolina look at its credentialing laws and come up with a military compact for the spouse. If, if, so we can do that. We believe what you're saying here will do that. Like many of them, you know, the, there's a teacher shortage, and it was predicted years ago because the baby boomers are retiring. But many of our baby boomers are retiring earlier because they've not received a substantial raise in a number of years, and so their retirement rate is not going to go up that much by hanging around and while they're still young they can go to a neighboring state and collect their North Carolina retirement and uh, make money someplace else and, and supplement that and finally I'll just say that maybe 
it's time that we as superintendent and the legislature, both the House and Senate, sit back down again because part of our reputation in North Carolina is because of an unintended consequence of the last couple of years and some of the dialogue that's gone on. I think as superintendents and you, uh, with your intent to do well for our kids, could maybe sit down and correct some of that perception because North Carolina now, when you travel around the country, people want to know what's going wrong in North Carolina. And I think there's a lot of things that are right. I think as superintendents, we can sit down with you and maybe begin to uh, get those unintended consequences back on, online. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Superintendent Barry Williams from Gates County. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, you know, I, I agree with all my colleagues here. Um, and I didn't come to the meeting scripted. And I didn't read all the reports. I'll be honest with you. I got other issues that, that I feel like they're more important. And that's my students in the schools. Um, you know, teaching is a profession that creates all the other professions, is the way I look at it. And you're looking, or you're listening to right now, a person who dropped out of school. And I had a college professor tell me, he said, you, you were coming back to school. It's really important. But I went and I got a job on the railroad. I worked on the railroad for 10 years, north and southern. And uh, the more that I continued to work on the railroad uh, in north and southern, it was actually north and western, uh, which actually stands for nights and weekends. Uh, <laughs> I, I just got tired of that, and I wanted to do something different. And this college professor said, you ought to go back to school, teach school. It's really interesting. It's pretty good pay. Uh, you'll have a good time, and you'll make an impact. And so uh, I think that that is uh, one of the main reasons that uh, I went back to school. And so uh, what I hear today, and I do agree with Dr. Little, is uh, except in my school, third graders, post on the bulletin boards, what do you want to be when you grow up? And uh, most of them have, I want to be a teacher. And I know he's asking his 12th graders, 11th graders and 12th graders, but if the mindset for my third graders are wanting to be a teacher, that just excites me so much. But what I hear today and what I hear when I'm in the halls when my teachers don't see me is I have educators telling young people if you're creative and you're smart and you're young, you need to do something else. And those are the teachers that I need in my schools. I've got a math department that's crippled. I've got an English department that needs English teachers. And I have a CTE program, which is very, very important in Gates County with farming and agriculture, uh, which is just vital to the, to the community. I had a 37-year-old veteran, he retired. And now my CTE program is in jeopardy because I can't find anyone. Um, so, uh, you know, th those are the, some, some of the things that, that we're dealing with. And one scenario that we had, which I think is important to say or state, is we had a teacher who was a very good math teacher in one of our elementary schools. She was a fourth grade teacher. And she was encouraged to go to Virginia and teach. And what enticed her was the money. And so, uh, she left right before school started. All of her colleagues got mad at her, but uh, she went on and it took us till the end of October to get a licensed teacher to come to teach fourth grade. And that's pretty bad when you walk in and you see the kids, you know, doing the best they can, and, you know, substitute teacher, that's good and that's what we need. But uh, if it wasn't for retired teachers right now, I don't know what we'd do. But thank you very much, I really enjoyed being here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, like we saved the best toys, uh, Superintendent Jeff Booker from Gaston County. Well, good morning. I, I want to start by saying I'm very blessed and that uh, many of you sitting around this table, I've had dialogue. I want to thank you for last year. You know, I'm fortunate that Representative Corbett is an open line of communication and allows me to have input. Representative Horn, Representative Johnson were very communicative during this process. So I come here today looking at people I'm used to talking with. Uh, it is fun being last. It's check, they said that, check, they said that. I want to put it a little more context. I come from this different, various experience. I have 20 years of private industry experience. And so when I look at that, I had 19,028 teachers allotted to me by the state of North Carolina. We opened school with 29 babies. 
My previous life. Wait, wait, you have how many teachers allocated to you? 1,900. 1,928. 1, we opened up 29 vacancies. My previous life, that's a one and a half percent turnover rate. I'm used to that. But as Barry just said, tell that to those 27 parents who don't have a third grade teacher. It's a little different than plugging somebody into the assembly line because it's not an assembly line. Our little kids don't come to us in boxes of 20 and get to plug them in. They come in and they deal with like one of my colleagues yesterday who a bus pulled up to pick a child up at the stop and there'd been a sheep right there. The mother and father shot in front of the child and he spent the entire morning trying to figure out did the kids on the bus see the shooting? What had happened 30 seconds before? What had happened? There? That's our lives. That's what we get to do, and that's what our teachers deal with every day. And whether they're in a high socioeconomic, low socioeconomic, we are a reflection of our society. And so when we have a vacancy, it ripples through our community. It doesn't just hit that classroom. It hits the grocery store. It hits into other pieces of our taxation. So I can go on and on, but I want to give you a little context. This is something that was sent to me by one of my leaders. I run a 160,000 square foot facility with nearly 100 employees. I have over 1,000 customers, not counting their parents. I deal with an annual budget nearing a million dollars. I have a master's degree and a doctorate, both of which I earned summa cum laude. And I undertake all of that responsibility for less than $80,000 a year. I lost my assistant principal two weeks before school started when they went to Indiana as an assistant principal and make more than I make. But I'm still here because I grew up here and I have a doctorate because a teacher believed in me. So we could go on and on about numbers. That's the real life. That's what I want you to remember. If you remember nothing else about Gaston County, we have dedicated people who care. And what we have found, we have a teacher in Introduction program when they come to work for us. We've been written up nationally for our TIPS program. That's how we get. But when I sit in a room and listen to folks, just as they pointed out, did you ever think in your 35 year career that you would not be able to find an elementary teacher? You know, the math shortage we saw, the science, we understand the competition, but we, that's where we've reached. And so this is real to us. It's not a crime, it's not a whine. And so money, as Dr. Emery said, showing them some commitment. But I'll tell you, honestly, Frank sort of touched on this. It's the professionalism. When Sean was talking about having security and training, when I met with my teachers and I'll speak with them, they just want to be told they do a good job and they make a difference. And they do do that. And too often we focus on the one and not the 1900 that I have. And so I'll be quiet with you. Thank you for allowing us to be here today. Thank you.